everyone has a guilty pleasure when it comes to media. Some people watch the Jersey Shore, others spend hundreds of dollars on gotcha mobile games. And I... I like found footage movies. Yeah, I love the Blair Witch and Cloverfield, and a lot of people are with me. But I go beyond that. I scrape the bottom of the barrel for this shit. I'll watch any film that promises a vomit-inducing monster chase at the end. It's just who I am. I can't help it. Of course, I prefer a great found footage movie like Naroi the Curse or Wreck, but man, there's only so many good found footage movies. Once all of those are exhausted, it's time to head over to the metaphorical $3 DVD bin and pull out some, uh, let's say, less than great films. In my video here, I hope to showcase some of the not-as-well-received found footage movies that I've come across in my years of subjecting myself to this genre. Before I get into this, I guess I should throw up a disclaimer. I'm preemptively dunking on these movies, but don't get the wrong idea, I do enjoy the movies I'm about to go over. I just recognize that they may lack in areas I might value more if I was in a more critical mindset. I generally don't go into movies blind. I like to do a little bit of research before dedicating an hour or two of my time to a movie that could potentially be straight up irredeemable and a waste of my time. If I see a 7.0 or above on IMDb, I know this is some movie I should probably give a fair amount of attention to. If it has around a 5.0 to a 7.0, it's something I'll not dedicate as much mental energy to. And once we get below 5.0, I'm just, I'm just there for the cool monster scenes. I guess that's kind of my main question when picking a found footage movie. Does it have a cool monster? I'm a sucker for cool creature design and special effects. I like seeing what weird concepts a filmmaker's mind can come up with to wring out certain emotions. Are they going for purely scares, like with Freddy Krueger? Or are they trying to evoke feelings of disgust and discomfort like in society? Or do they just go for the purely bizarre like in The Thing? All of that is to say, I just turn off my mind when watching a lot of found footage movies. I'll give most the benefit of the doubt for the first 20 minutes or so, but if the characters don't hook me or the plot's boring, I'll slowly lose interest. At least until a cool monster appears. So I think it's time to finally talk about some movies. I hope I'm not starting off with a showstopper here, but I want to talk about my favorite found footage movie. Or should I say, series. I'm talking about the VHS series. VHS, VHS2, and VHS Viral are anthologies. They're a collection of short films. They each have a framing story of a character finding VHS tapes, and each tape is one of the short films. It might be cheating to say a collection of 15 or so short films is my favorite, but who cares? It's my channel. If you got a problem with it, Write a 500 word essay in the comments about why I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> I guess the problem with talking about the VHS series in a video about found footage movies is that they aren't all bad. Some of them I genuinely consider good or even amazing, but I'll save my talk about those for another day. For now, let's look at the black sheep of the series, VHS Viral. It's definitely the least liked of the series by a lot of people, me included. I remember being so excited to see it when it was coming out. I had recently just watched VHS 1 and 2, and because of the couple actual good short films in them, I had somewhat high hopes. I was overwhelmingly disappointed. I distinctly remember hating the framing narrative. Of course, with the film's title, it kind of stepped past the connection to VHS tapes that the first two had. I don't even remember how the films are presented in-universe. The first two had characters sitting in a room full of VHS tapes and they watched them. In this movie, the main kid is biking around a city, chasing down people who kidnapped his girlfriend? But he also stops to watch multiple 15-minute videos featuring proof of parallel universes and actual magic? I, I, I don't know. It's, it's stupid, and I remember hating the film because of it. After a recent rewatch, I was surprised to learn that the short films were actually kind of fun. In my mind, the idiocy of the framing narrative overshadowed the actual stories. But some of the hooks were kind of fun once I gave myself away to the movie. Yeah, sure, American teenagers are fighting cultist skeletons in some drainage ditch in Mexico. I'm not gonna say the sequence is good. I was very careful to use the word fun earlier. Kids are stupidly annoying and the progression of events makes no sense. But it's fun! Look at the skeletons here, it's amazing! These practical skeletons were made with love and you can tell. Regardless of the writing quality in any movie, I'll take time to appreciate a good practical effect. And this is a good-ass practical effect. One of the other short films, Parallel Monsters, has an absolutely amazing, mind-blowing, po positively bonkers moment. Allow me to set the scene. So a man named Alfonso builds a portal to a parallel universe in his basement. 
Great hook. I'm in. Once he looks through the portal he built, he sees... himself. The world through the portal is mirrored, but effectively the same. The basements look the same, they're dressed the same, and they both have a wife named Marta. After their initial disbelief, they decide to swap places with each other for 15 minutes or so. Seems harmless enough. What could go wrong? Alfonso I enters the world of Alfonso II, and he notices that their worlds aren't exactly the same. Where a picture of his wedding day exists in his world, this photo exists in its place in Alfonso II's world. He steps out of the basement, and Marta II seems to put Alfonso I off of it. She's acting a bit different to his Marta. He steps with her outside, and there's two men that she's talking with, and we're to believe they're going to get, uh, intimate. After some chit-chat, they head inside and the room immediately strikes him as bizarre. There's what seems to be a ritual playing out on the TV, and there's a bag filled with something gross and icky in front of the couch. The other men pick up on Alfonso I's hesitation and leave. As he and Marta too are sitting on the couch awkwardly, the sound of a horn coming from the sky breaks the silence. Alfonso I is obviously concerned, but Marta acts like it's no big deal. Distressed, he heads outside to go check it out. He points the camera to the sky and we get a pretty good look at what made the ominous sound earlier. While filming it, the two men that left earlier confront Alfonso I and are angry that he's filming. Interspersed throughout these events, we're shown that Alfonso I finds his way to a sleeping Marta I and starts taking pictures of her. Back to the other universe, Alfonso I attempts to run away, but the men cut him off, and they look... different. Alfonso I is shown doing the same thing in Marta I's bedroom. Alfonso I runs into the forest and is shortly tackled by one of the men. I'll just play the rest of the scene out, because you have to see it for yourself. I'm really unsure if this is something I should actually show, uncensored, because I have no fucking idea how this is going to play with the robots of the site. You know what? I'm feeling generous. I'll show you this scene as it is in the film, because you need to see it as the filmmakers intended. This is the moment this whole section of the video has been building up to. Prepare yourself. I... how can I put into words what we just saw? There is nothing I could write here to properly showcase all the emotions I felt when watching that scene. It's, it's both horrifying and hilarious. Incredibly awkward, yet striking. For better or worse, it sticks with you. And that's what I hope for in a good found footage movie. I want a specific scene or a moment I can think back to and say, Wow, that is a truly unique idea. That's where the genre truly shines, in presenting unique ideas that you would never see in a higher budget film. J just imagine, imagine this scene being pitched for a film with a $30 million budget. You'd get kicked out for even pretending like it was in the cards for the scene to be included. But with films in the $100,000 to even a $1 million range, you see a lot more creativity. Let's take a look at another low budget darling of mine, Grave Encounters 1 and 2. The first film is essentially satirizing shows in the vein of ghost adventures. The film opens with the producer saying something like, This is all real footage. There are no visual effects. It's only edited for time. We can't explain any of this. As found footage movies like to do. The rest of the film is raw footage captured from the camera that was being used to shoot the in-universe ghost show, also called Grave Encounters. The host, Lance Preston, immediately evokes all kinds of hosts on shows like this. He's intensely dramatic and knows how to film around real events to make it seem like something paranormal actually happened. I don't really want to give a full summary of this movie because there isn't really a reason to. This film doesn't have any particular moment like VHS Viral's Parallel Monsters. It's just kind of a vibe, you know? This movie is definitely more than the sum of its parts. The acting is awful at points, writing is cliche, and some visual effects are laughable, but it's still enjoyable. Well... Let me, let me give a quick overview before I get into the next movie, because this, this will be important later. This episode they're shooting features them staying overnight at a supposedly haunted psychiatric hospital. It goes about as you would expect. Nothing happens at first. They're grasping at straws like you'd see in a traditional ghost show. But as the night goes on, they start to capture actual unexplained things on camera. And towards the end, they're being, they're being chased by scary monsters. Everyone but Lance bites the dust, but we're left wondering if Lance is the same as he was when he entered. 
Grave Encounters 2. This is where that indie creativity comes in. The first minute or two of the film features YouTubers reviewing Grave Encounters 1. A couple of people talk about how they like the visual effects or whatever, but others harp on how awful it was. My first thought was that they're actors reading a script, but I like the idea that they actually put real YouTubers genuinely talking about their thoughts on the film. Hopefully my thoughts here have been interesting enough to get me a part in Grave Encounters 3. Hey, Vicious Brothers? Hit me up. Anyway, one of the reviewers featured in the segment turns out to be the main character of the film. His review is a little different, though. He's not talking about whether it was good or not. He's talking about whether it was real or not. He's adamant that the film Grave Encounters actually did happen. And after a bit of research, he confirms that everything that happened in the film was real. Now that I'm writing this, I'm a bit confused on the implications of that. Was the Grave Encounters show real in-universe, and the film Grave Encounters was just the footage of the crew's untimely demise? Or did the show and the film Grave Encounters exist only as a plot device? Uh, it's, a, it's a bit confusing, I know, but, but this question is brought on by the fact that Lance Preston's actor, Sean Rogerson, is brought into this film as a character. Like, they just acknowledged that Lance Preston was a character, and he was played by Sean. He was the only one to survive from the first film, but nobody knows what happened to him. They even visit his mom's house to learn what happened to him. It's, it's bizarre. Alex, the movie reviewer we're introduced at the beginning, grabs a bunch of his friends and they start documenting their findings as they head to the psychiatric hospital from the first film. Just like the first film, nothing seems to happen when they arrive, but it escalates into chaos pretty quickly. Amid the chaos, they meet another human being, Someone that looks like he's been there for quite a while. Someone... familiar. Yeah, they bump into Sean Rogerson. He's been living in that hospital for nine years. Nine years avoiding all the spooky paranormal stuff. Nine years crawling through the vents. Nine years eating rats. I'm down. That's a pretty cool premise if you ask me. Sean obviously isn't who he was nine years ago, but he's still able to help the new group. He knows all the secrets of the prison he's lived in since the first movie. I'm gonna stop my explanation there, because Grave Encounters 2 is a genuinely fun movie. It's not a good movie by a lot of metrics, but it's fun. Quote, bad found footage movies can really shine in that aspect. A movie can have a ton of bad qualities, but that doesn't make the film itself bad. Good acting and writing help for sure. It's why Noroi and The Blair Witch are amazing films. They succeed in almost every category. But a bad film can get away with a lot of bad aspects if they do one aspect really well. None reflect this better than Willow Creek. I kind of feel bad talking about this movie after giving this whole speech about bad found footage movies, because this is probably on the verge of being a genuine good film. I only bring it up because it does one thing absolutely perfectly. That is, building tension. The first three quarters of the film is pretty much just boring vacation footage in a town near a famous Bigfoot sighting. A man is filming a documentary about Bigfoot and his girlfriend reluctantly comes along. She isn't really a believer, but she also doesn't really hold it against him. Like I said, a lot of it is boring on the face of it. The guy conducts a few interviews, but none of the people make any huge claims about a Bigfoot sighting, despite his gentle persuasion to guide them in that direction. So after 50 minutes of exploring the town and some interpersonal conflicts, we arrive at Willow Creek's moment. They're camping in a forest near the town, and some ominous sounds wake them up in the middle of the night. This scene lasts like 15 minutes and is all one continuous take. There might be a hidden cut somewhere, but it doesn't really matter in the moment. Like, look at this. You're just staring at these people for 15 minutes, and they're horrified as indescribable roars are heard in the distance and not long later, footsteps right outside their tent. They just sit there, often in silence. A quarter to half of the time spent in this scene is just them looking around and listening. I get put on edge pretty quickly when a horror film goes dead silent, because it almost always means a jump scare is coming. I guess I'm a pretty jumpy person in general. It feels weird saying this after writing that, but I, I love jump scare bait. The pure silence gets the heart pumping, thoughts like, Is there something in the woods? Were we just imagining stuff like that earlier? Change almost immediately when you faintly hear some ungodly screeching in the distance. Oh god, we weren't imagining that stuff. 
There's a squatch in them ones. I'm not really making a statement of quality here, because I'm not sure if these two films are equal, but it's reminiscent of the Blair Witch in a lot of ways. There's a lot of not showing and letting you imagine what's going on outside of the tent. Of course, it's a budget thing, but just like in the Blair Witch, it works. When you're on a tiny budget, I'd rather you not flaunt a shitty costume or CG monster in broad daylight for a dozen scenes, as hilarious as it would be. The two actors really pull off being terrified. If I were to speculate, I bet they did that thing they did in the Blair Witch while the filmmakers did unscripted stuff to scare the actors in the scene here. I can very easily imagine the director saying, Okay, you guys sit in this tent and go through your lines. In between those, just, uh, just ad-lib. Winky face. Uh, I lied earlier. That wasn't speculation, that was verbatim what the director said. That happened. Yes, I have proof. No, you can't see it. Stepping back, let's look at the film as a whole. The critics' rating on Rotten Tomatoes is at a respectable 80%, while the audience score sits at 34. Why is it so low after all the praise I just heaped on? I guess it all comes down to the word boring. I used it multiple times when talking about it here, even though I thought the tent scene was engaging and had me on the edge of my seat. I can't deny that it was 15 minutes of a static camera. If you didn't find that enjoyable, there's probably not a whole lot you'd find to like in this film. I guess it's just a matter of perspective, though. I'm willing to give a lot of leeway to films in this genre. As I've said, as long as a found footage film has an awesome moment, then I'm happy. Because that's all we remember films by, right? We don't remember the hour-long build-up to an explosive climax in a film. We remember the climax itself. But that climax wouldn't mean a whole lot without a meaningful build-up. I've described found footage films as my guilty pleasure. Now that I've had some time to really write out my thoughts, I don't think that's fair to the films I've discussed. They were genuinely enjoyable. And that's only because the filmmakers put in hard work to try and make something enjoyable in a genre that has a pretty bad name. Of course, there's general problems that resonate throughout a lot of films in the genre, like bad acting or a boring plot but a couple of bad aspects don't make a film itself bad. As long as there's some aspects enjoyable by someone out there, then it has value. In this genre, that value is shown through creative monster designs and interesting plot hooks. And, and like, that's all I can ask for in a found footage movie. I don't need good acting. I don't need mind-blowing writing. I need to have a good time. And man, if I'm looking for a good time, I can't go wrong with found footage. Thanks for sticking around, whoever you are. This is my first time stepping my foot outside of gaming content on the channel, so if you're one of my older fans, I hope you don't mind it too much. If you're one of my newer fans, I hope you go and check out some of my other videos. They're pretty good, and I can say that in a completely non-biased manner. Either way, I'm not completely pivoting to talking about movies, I'm just trying to broaden the types of media that I talk about. I don't just play video games, so I'd like to talk about more than just video games. I hope you stick around with me for the ride. Thanks for listening this long, and I'll see you on the flip.